Thank you, choir, for that great song. Just like to read a portion of scripture from James chapter 1, verse 3. Knowing this, uh, rather, finally, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You know, one important step of the maturing process of the Christian is how to look at and evaluate the trials that you may face. You know, James was speaking to a crowd of people, a group of people that had been persecuted and they had scattered from Jerusalem and the surrounding areas and now they had found a new location to live and maybe they were thinking, well, we've we're past that time of trial. We're past that time of persecution. Everything's going to be okay. And I think James wanted to let them know, listen, uh, there could be more trials. Just because of the nature of the Christian life, you could be experiencing more problems. And so he told them, in order to go through this process, the first step is to know how to look at a trial and have the right attitude. Because he says in verse 2, count it all joy. That word count means to evaluate. It's an accounting term, how to look at something and see the value of that. And so James says, listen, when you're finding yourself in diverse temptation, understand the value of what you're facing. You know, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Marie Kondo. Marie Kondo is uh, one of those cluttering experts who comes into your house and will help you get rid of all the excess stuff that you may have. And she has a technique, it's called the, uh, the Con Marie technique. And what she does, she tells you to pick up an article, hold it in your hands, and then ask yourself, do I want to keep this? And if there is a, what she terms, a spark of joy, if there is a, a feeling in your heart or a feeling in yourself, if you get a feeling that rises, then keep it. If there's no feeling or the feeling sags, then throw it away. And so you go through all your stuff based on your feelings. You can imagine the anxiety I had one day when I came home and my wife was going through my house and through my stuff with the Marie Kondo experience and watching the stuff piling up on the get rid of. And then my fears increased the more when my wife came to me and grabbed me and held on to me <laughs> for about a minute. And she whispered in my ear, I'll keep you <laughs> for now. Well, while going through stuff, we can use the, that type of method. We cannot rely on our feelings when we're going through trials. We have to know something. We have to know that we have a great God who loves us. And His providence is far greater than we could imagine. And that trial that we're going through may seem bad. It could be, could be something that we want to get rid of, but God may have a purpose. And we got to trust God. And we need to change our attitude and say, I can see value in this. God's going to teach me something that I need. And so we need to trust the Lord. And so if you're facing a trial today, don't go on your feelings. Go on the truth of God's word, that he loves you. And he has a purpose for your life. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear God and heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all your blessings. And Lord, we pray that you would bless those today. I'm sure there's some here going through trials, going through diverse temptations in some respect. And Father, I pray, help them to see the, the good. Help them to realize they have a God that loves them and is using this for, to make them better. So Father, bless them and keep them and give them the strength they need to face what they are going through. Lord, for the rest of us, we thank you for bringing us here today. Bless our service today. Bless the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. And Father, we thank you for those who gave today, those who gave their offering. We lift up and praise what has been accomplished and what we're able to do with the monies and the funds that have been given, that we may continue to give out the Word of God and see this gospel spread through our community and around the world. So bless us now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak
Well, we're glad that you're here this morning gathered in worship, and we're so thankful that you could join us on this great day. You know, this is the most important worship time is our congregational singing, where we all participate together in unity and lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I just got thinking about it, just sitting over in the pew listening to that song. I don't know that we always deserve to worship Jesus. I've seen those bumper stickers that say, praise God anyhow, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so there are times where we come to the throne and we're not in the right spirit and we're not worshiping in truth. And I pray that that's not the case today, that we would come to him in the right heart's attitude, that we might lift up his holy name. The song we're gonna sing first reminds us how important it is to talk about Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus right on my heart, every word. Let's stand and sing together. Let's lift him up today. forget what the message is. I want you to hear the message of this choir. Help me out with these this uh, harmonies, will you, and sing out this morning. Tell of the cross where they nailed him. Let's sing together.
Amen. The next song, what a friend we have in Jesus. You know, the Bible says that uh, scarcely for a righteous man would a man give his life, but the Lord gave his life for us. What a wonderful story that he would call us his friend and give us his life. What a friend we have in Jesus. I hope you know him today. I hope you know him as your personal Lord and Savior. It's a personal decision. No, no family ties can save you. Being part of a Christian nation, so to speak, cannot save you. Going to church cannot save you. You must have a personal relationship with this friend called Jesus. I hope you know him today. Let's sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I'm going to put Brother Baker on the spot. And uh, we were talking in our my office this morning before we prayed about what the Lord did in your heart last Monday night and just about Shiloh and the God's presence in our lives. Would you just share a testimony? Uh, yeah, it blessed my heart this morning. Yeah, so last Monday night I was here in that pew back there, the number three pew, and sitting and listening to the preaching, and he was teaching on Shiloh and going through the scriptures here and there. And uh, it really challenged my heart, especially as I was reading the Word of God. And Jeremiah 7, I was reading that passage, and it just made me weep on the spot. I thought, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, am I that? Am I like that? And, and, and it really brought me under great conviction. And then I had, an, I don't know if you guys ever had this, but I had an argument with the Lord right there in pew number three. He said, go forward. And I thought, no, I don't want to go forward. I mean, what will people think of me? And he said, go forward. And I thought, well, I'll go at the end. He said, isn't, it, isn't he done now in your heart? And I'm, yes, he was. And so I, I remember coming forward and uh, calling out to the Lord. And, and uh, it was such a, to me, a memorable night that uh, the word of God spoke in my heart. And... And, and challenged me. And it, it was such a blessing. It really was. Yeah. If I could encourage you to go back and watch Monday night if you weren't here, it was a Bible study about Shiloh where God puts his name. And Shiloh in Genesis 49 is a name of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, but we learned how God can pronounce Ichabod. 
the glory is departed. And that's what we were talking about. We don't want ever God to remove his candlestick from our church. We want to be a bright and shining light for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would challenge you, it's a good message for everybody to hear Monday night service. Uh, going back and listen to it on our live stream. Let's sing again. Uh, we're singing about Jesus this morning. I hope you understand this. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. For me like Jesus. Isn't that a great truth? Praise the Lord for it. Uh, let's, let's change our song. 628. Uh, we'll sing it a cappella, I think. 628, Brother Judge, if you can put that up on the, on the screen, screen. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus. I love how that song starts. Uh, when a song starts like that, you, you know it's, it's on the right track. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Let's sing this morning. Lift up your voices a cappella this morning. <laughs> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the And 
Let's end with this course. There's something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I want to introduce our, our ensemble song and the title is simply who you say I am you know and as we think about our lives we we listen to a lot of people right we listen to our our spouse perhaps we listen to our kids we listen to our friends we listen to all the the media that's out there you know and we if, if we're not careful we can start listening to them when we're starting to to get our own view of ourselves our own view of, of who we are um, in the Bible, we, we read in John chapter 8, verse 44, ye, have, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. You know, the, the enemy of our Lord is Satan. And, and there, if, there's, I don't know, just an observation that so many of the things that we hear, so many of the things that we let in, aren't truth you know and we, we don't often guard about, guard from that and so this morning as we sing this song I want us just to think as you hear the lyrics so many of them are right from scripture you know if we're trying to find the measuring stick of how do I find truth how do I know what what is real how do I know what's fake how do I know what might be a, a message from from uh, Satan that's a lie that's that's fake that's false and we guard it or we, we gauge it by God's word you know, some of the lyrics that we're going to hear today is, who am I that the highest king would welcome me? You know, that's a truth statement, that God welcomes us. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. One of the, another set of the lyrics, who, is, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I'm chosen, not forsaken. I am who, he, who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. As we, as we listen to this song, I want you to think, what scripture supports that? 
What scripture tells me that this is truth, that I can take this, I can accept it, that I can listen to it? 1 John 3 verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That's an awesome truth statement. And I encourage you, again, as we sing this song, think, just ask the Spirit to, to bring to mind from His Word, from His message to us, what's the truth? What's the verse that supports this? What's, what's that? Who are you calling me from Scripture? Let's pray together. Lord, I do love you. God, I thank you for your Word. I thank you that you speak truth. God, that when you say that you love me, that that's truth. When you redeem me, when you call me your own, those are all truth. God, I pray that you'd help us to be able to, to reject the false things around us, God, the, the lies of this world, the lies of the devil uh, that, that so often define us. God, help us to find our purpose, help us to find our fulfillment in you and the truth that you call us. We pray in Christ's name, amen.
all our lives. As We're growing. We want our freedom. We want our freedom. As a teenager, I remember, I wanted my freedom. You know, and yet this whole world is a slave to sin. You know, and we're so removed from it. We don't, we don't remember what slavery, you know, it's not part of our lives. We, you know, but think about it. We are a slave to sin until Christ gave us freedom. We are made free. What an awesome, awesome thought. At this time, we'll, we'll pray and we'll dismiss our boys and girls to junior church. Lord, we do love you, God. I thank you for your freedom that you've given us. God, I pray for anyone in this room this morning that, that hasn't experienced that. God, that they're not your child. God, they're a slave to sin. They're of their father, the devil. I pray that you'd convict them this morning of their need to trust you and find new life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. Let's take your Bibles, please. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Uh, Brother Judge, we're going in a different direction than the video that we have. So Romans chapter 5 this morning. I just feel led to preach something a little different than what I had planned. It was one of those weeks, it's, it's funny, you come off a revival meeting and then yet struggled knowing what the Lord would have me to preach. And often that's not the case. Usually you come off revival services and your heart is full and you can feel like preach any text in the Bible. And, but I really struggled, but I had something ready. But the Lord, this is why I'm sure that the Lord has something else in mind. Romans chapter 5 this morning. We're going to go ahead and pray before we even read. And as we pray, let's remember uh, a few requests this morning. Bill Foreman uh, has an angiogram tomorrow morning scheduled. Let's pray for him. Uh, Larry Wilson has surgery on Tuesday, a knee replacement. Uh, Jennifer Simmons is home this morning and home already. And I stopped by, I said, is she coming home today? And they said, home now, already home. So they let her go early today. And so we praise the Lord for that. And it's good to have uh, Bob Barnsley's uh, stepson with us, Ian. You've been praying for Ian, uh, was uh, hit by a car and had some terrible injuries. Doesn't remember it, it hit him so quickly, of course, knocked him out and, and uh, but still, still has a ways to go, but pray for him. But so good to have Ian in church this morning and uh, we praise the Lord for his healing thus far. And I saw him in the hallway and I thought, you wouldn't even know. And that's what God can do. You know, he can take that. Now he's still got some pain and things, but let's continue to pray for Ian uh, this morning. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll remember all of these. Father, we do thank you and praise you for Jennifer going home today. We know, Lord, that she's not completely healed, but we know, Lord, that she's healed enough that uh, the doctors are satisfied to send her home. But we pray that you continue to strengthen her entire body. Pray for Alan, who wasn't feeling well the last couple days. I pray that you give him the strength to be a help to her. Lord, we pray for... Uh, Bill, who goes for an angiogram in the morning, and pray that you'd give the doctors wisdom as they search for these problems. Pray for Brother Wilson as he has surgery on Tuesday, that you'd give the doctors uh, steadiness of hand and, and wisdom, but also give him a quick recovery. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Ian, Lord, to see the, his recovery, Lord, that, Lord, this gentleman we've been praying for. Uh, Lord, good to have him in church today. We pray that you continue to heal his body and strengthen him day by day. Father, I pray that you'd help us in the word now. Lord, you just burdened my heart, Lord, about this message. And I pray, Lord, that you would empower it. Lord, would you take the word of God, the scriptures, and Lord, burn them in our hearts today. Lord, if there's one that's not saved, maybe today they would come to Christ. Lord, we often talk about making a decision. But Lord, I pray that the decision would be taken out of our hands. I pray that the conviction of the Holy Ghost would be so great in our lives today, Lord, that there, there'd be nothing we could do except cry out to Jesus. And so, Lord, move upon us, we pray. And Father, I need your help. I surrender to you, and I pray that you might fill me. And Lord, we'll thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we're just going to read the first two verses, and there's a great word in there I want you to look at with me this morning. Romans chapter 5. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Can we just take a moment and read those again? Matter of fact, why don't we read them out loud all together? If you have your Bibles this morning, open them. Romans chapter 5. Let's read it together. Just read with me as I, as I speak these words. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
What a wonderful thing it is to know that we can be justified. Now, the Bible word for justified is a little bit different than what we might hear in a court system today. In a court of law, you might hear that somebody had committed a justifiable offense. I don't know that there's a lot of offenses out there that are justifiable, but what they mean by that is that perhaps it was done in self-defense. Perhaps a man killed another man in self-defense and they would say, well, that's justifiable homicide. It's hard to put those two words together, isn't it? Justifiable and homicide. And yet they will declare somebody justified if they were acting in self-defense. There might be other types of justifiable crimes if it was done to protect your family or to protect your home. And so that's what we think about when we think we were justified in our behavior or justified in our actions. Sometimes our idea of justification is really not justification at all, but rather vindication. Isn't it, isn't it true that sometimes we say, well, I did that to them because they first did that to me. And what we are saying is I was justified in my revenge. I was justified in my behavior and my actions. And often we get that when we're dealing with our young people, our, our children and our teenagers. Well, they hit me first. And they think that somehow that justifies them. But really, they were being vindictive. I, I don't know about you, but my brother and I, we used, to, we used to tussle a little bit. I know it's hard to believe. But we, we'd get in, and, and I can remember honestly saying, you know, one would, one would punch the other in the arm or something, and then when the person hit back, whether it was me or him, they say, well, hey, I didn't hit you that hard. It had to be measured out the same, right? It had to be, well, how, how, I don't know. I can't feel your pain. I don't know how hard I hit you. Just in case, let me whack you, you know? And we sometimes feel like it ought to be measured out in that way. But either way, it's just being vindictive. The Bible says we're to forgive. Think about this. What if God measured out everything you deserve because of your sin? Think about that. And yet he says, why don't I just do this? Why don't I just pronounce you justified? All those things that you did to me, I'm going to say they were justified. Can you imagine? The word justified in the scriptural sense means to pronounce righteous. Well, wait a minute, Lord. You remember that time I blasphemed your name? The Lord Jesus Christ says, because of what, Jesus, because of what I did on Calvary, because of your faith in me, because of the forgiveness of the blood of the cross, because of all that I've done to take out your sins upon my shoulders and to pay the price for all of your wrongs, because of all of that, I'm just going to pronounce it justified. When I think about it in that sense, to me, it's one of the most stinging damnations of all of Scripture. That God would look at me and say, I excuse it all. Everything you did to me, I declare righteous. But God, I deserve punishment. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. But I put it on my son, Jesus Christ. But God, I deserve your wrath. Oh, absolutely. But I put it on my son, Jesus Christ. But God, I'm a sinner. No. He who knew no sin was made sin for you. that you might know the righteousness of God. That's what justification is. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior. Can I say this? Understand this. This is a binary choice. There's only two choices to be made. There's only two ways to deal with your sin, and the choice is yours. 
The Bible says that every man must give an account of himself unto God. The Bible says that it is given unto men once to die and after this the judgment. We will stand before a holy God and one of two things will happen. You will stand accountable for your sin or you'll point to the blessed Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who took your sin for you. Either way, our sin will be paid for. The wrath of God will be poured out. Punishment will come. And you have one of two choices. Trust Jesus and live or reject Jesus and die. Because the wages of sin is death. No man can pay that. No man can afford In Revelation, we read about that death. It says, For whosoever is not found written in the Lamb's book of life shall be cast into the lake of fire. And a couple verses later, it tells us this is the second death. This is the eternal separation from God because of our sin. He said, oh, but you don't understand. I've, I've never killed anybody. I've never hurt anybody. I've, I've never plundered and, and, and pillaged and, and stole or hurt anybody, really. I may have told a white lie. Or... The Bible simply says it this way, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Revelation, when we read about the lake of fire, it says that those that were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life were cast in the lake of fire. And in that place, it talks about murderers and, and, and blasphemers of God. And on and on the list goes. And right in the middle, it says liars. Even the ones that told a little white lie are listed in that number. But here's the thing. The greatest sinner in the world can reach out by faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And he'll pronounce you righteous, justified. Notice what this verse says, Romans chapter 5. Therefore, being justified, what are those next two words? By faith. By faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing I, I, I feel like is probably the ultimate goal of most people, to have peace with God. When you say that would be a wonderful thing, if I could just have peace with God, you'll never have peace with God unless you're first justified. Your sin will forever hang over your head. It'll forever be a mark upon your record that will be revealed in the last day as we stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the record is laid out before us, it will forever be a place of guilt and shame. But when we're justified, we can have peace with God. I don't know that there's anything that we would fear more than standing before our King with sin upon our shoulders. Eric Hilton likes to tease every once in a while, and he'll say, I fear no man and only one woman. How many of you men can relate? How many of you men are afraid to put up your hand right there? (laughs) Good job, Brother Rob. Proud of you. But the very truth of it is, is that might be a lighthearted joke, but there is one that we fear. If you're in your sin, you ought to fear God. But the wonderful news is that by grace through faith you can be saved. Notice, notice those same words echoed in this passage. Therefore being justified by faith. Verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace. 
Faith is that moment that you put your trust in Christ. It's that belief in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is and he will do what he said he will do. When he said it is finished on the cross of Calvary, he accomplished the payment for our sin, that he took his sin, our sin upon his shoulder and it was washed by his precious blood and that by faith we can trust him and when we believe that moment, by grace he saves us. That means he gives us the gift of eternal life and because of that, we can have peace with God. Do you know there's so many struggling today because they just don't have peace? They think that the world will satisfy. Several years ago, I don't know why this popped in my head just now, several years ago, we had to make a visit. I think it was a little girl that was in our Sunday school ministry and maybe still comes, I don't know, because I can't remember her name. It's been almost a decade. And she, after a service, it was vacation Bible school, I believe it was summertime. And she said, would you go visit my dad? Mom and dad were divorced, separated. Would you go visit my dad? I said, yeah, we'd be glad to go visit your dad. I believe it was Pastor Josh Walsh that was with me and the two of us went and he knew where they lived and where dad lived. And so we went and we went into this place and I'm I, I gonna be honest, we were scared. There was, there was drug addicts laying in the hallways. It was a, it was a rough place. Well, this man at least had a, a closed door in his own apartment, and we went into his apartment, and we were visiting a little bit, and I mean, right in the middle of his living room, there was a clawfoot bathtub. It wasn't hooked up to anything. It was just sitting there. And in the bathtub was a transmission from a car. I mean, I, I don't know if that's modern decor or what that is, but that's what was going on. I mean, it was just an odd situation. Everything in the room was out of place. It just didn't seem like uh, to have a, uh, I mean, how many of you ladies would tolerate a transmission in the bathtub, let alone the bathtub in the living room? And so it was just an odd situation. And there was, there was paraphernalia sprawled all out and there was, there was alcohol everywhere. And it was just an absolute disaster. But as I was thinking of these scriptures this morning, I thought even he can be declared Righteous. Even he can cry out to Jesus. And I'm not here to talk poorly about him or condemn him in any way because I was, uh, the Bible says, for such were some of you. I'm just a sinner saved by grace like everybody else, but for the grace of God. But I'm here to say that the, the situation was so, was so rife with sin and there was just so much uh, obviousness about uh, what was going on in his life and how far away he was from God. Uh, but I'm impressed this morning to say that even he can cry help by faith. If he believes the precious gospel story and he believes that Jesus died for his sins, that God will by no doubt save him by his grace. And by the way, that grace, it says here, is wherein we stand. We'd all be lost without it. It's the grace of God that saves us. There's not a lot of songs written about the word justified, are there? We sing wonderful grace of Jesus. We sing about his grace. We sing his mercy all and free. We sing songs about mercy and grace. Redeemed how I love to proclaim. We sing about redemption. We don't sing a lot about justify, but it's one of the greatest words in the Bible. But there is that one song, Complete in Thee. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified, salvation wrought. I don't know if that's why I like that song so much, but very rarely do we hear that word. But it means to be declared righteous. The ensemble just sang, a song, I believe the title is Who You Say I Am. Is that right? Kevin, is that the name of that song? Who You Say I Am. Do you know that that's all that matters? It doesn't matter for a minute what I think of you or anybody else in this room thinks of you. But whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Who the Son declares righteous is righteous. Back in Leviticus, I believe it's chapter 14. I won't have you turn there. There's a story of the lepers. And what were the Jews to do if a man came down with leprosy? 
the Bible says they were to be put out of the camp, and if at some point, and, and I, I don't understand leprosy all that much. It's not a disease we see a lot today. It's still in some third world nations. But apparently that some people could get leprosy and recover. It wasn't very common, but it could happen. And if they were to recover from leprosy and they noticed that the white spots were leaving their body and perhaps their immune system was such that, that, they, could, that they could fight off this dreaded disease, that they were to go to the priest. And the priest would look over their bodies and inspect them. They said, wait a minute, why a priest and not a doctor? Because it was perceived to be a spiritual issue in those days. And he'd go to the priest, and the great high priest would look him over, and if he thought that he was healing, he would send him away for seven more days. And he'd say, come and see me in seven days. And in seven days, here's what the priest would do. He would bring him in this, the second time, and this time he wouldn't just look. He would touch his hands. You see, leprosy causes great nerve damage. And you might be able to cover up some of your spots. You might be able to disguise some of the things going on. But if you were to touch your hands and feel them, you would cry out in pain from that nerve damage. Nobody wanted to touch a leper. But the great high priest in love would reach down and touch. And he'd feel. Do you know we have a great high priest as well, Jesus Christ? He never feared to touch a leper. But here's the great news about that story. You know what the great high priest did? If the great high priest declared that man clean, it was against the law for anybody else in all of Israel and all of the congregation to say anymore that he was unclean. Boy, we could use a policy like that, couldn't we? If the great high priest declared him clean... Nobody else had a right to say he was unclean. The leper would have to walk the streets looking for mercy. And he'd have to yell, unclean, to warn people that he was coming. But the moment he was declared clean, all that went away. We have a great high priest as well. When he declares you righteous, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You are his child no matter what anybody else says. Well, here's, sometimes we are imperfect children. Dare I say all the time. But by grace we can be declared righteous. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Here's the thing. Notice the process. By faith we have access into this grace through Jesus Christ. We are declared righteous. Then we have peace with God. And that peace of God brings hope. That priest of God brings hope. If I knew enough about the Bible to stand in church this morning, knowing I'm a sinner, and to sing a song about heaven, it would scare me. Because I would know I'm not headed there. If I knew enough about the Bible, to know that I must trust in Jesus Christ to have my sins forgiven. And to hear the ensemble sing, I'm a child of God, yes I am. And I'm not a child of God. I'd be scared to my core. Because if we don't have peace with God, we have no hope. And if we have no hope, we are miserable. So many just wandering around looking for hope. Looking for hope. 
Well, yesterday we did something kind of stupid. I'll admit it. My wife and I went Christmas shopping. How many of you started your Christmas shopping? I did not know that Black Friday is no longer a Friday. It's a month and a half. And we went down to Buffalo and spent the day together and we went into some stores and we got taken care of what we need to take care of. But we were in a couple of those stores and I'm telling you, it was chaos. Save 50 cents on a pillow and 400 people show up to save 50 cents. I'll pay the extra 50 cents, mail it to me. But anyway, we went. And I saw the loads of carts people had and the things that they and I thought, a lot of that stuff's not Christmas gifts. You're just buying it for yourself, and that's fine. I mean, we all need things, correct? But if they're going to save a nickel or a dime, they'll pile that cart up this high. How many of your men or your wives come home and said, I saved you a lot of money today. I only spent $400. The regular price was $600. Well, thanks, hon. I appreciate that. But that's what was going on. It was just an endless search to fill a void. I've heard it called retail therapy. Everywhere we went, we saw people trying to fill a void. I remember driving at one point and my wife says, does Buffalo have a nice section? And we finally found it. Does Buffalo have a nice area of town? You know a lot of those areas are marked by sin. That's what it is. Drug abuse, alcoholism, just trying to fill that void. Let me say this, there's no hope without Jesus. There's no hope without Jesus. By grace, you are saved through faith. And when we are saved by faith, he justifies us, he declares us righteous in his son, Christ Jesus. And when we are declared righteous, we can have peace with God. And when you have peace with God, you have a hope that one day you'll see Jesus. I wouldn't want to see Jesus if I didn't have hadn't been declared righteous. Have you ever done anything when you were a kid and you messed up so bad you were afraid to tell your parents? I, I remember thinking, my dad's going to kill me. Praise God he didn't. But I remember thinking that. My parents are going to kill me when they find out. Oh. You, better, you better fear standing before God one day. Well, the Bible says we, don't, we ought not fear man. They can only destroy the body. Rather fear God, who can destroy the body and soul in hell. We need to be declared righteous. We need to have peace with God. Then we can have hope. Because without hope, we're miserable. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment this morning. Let me ask you something, friend. Do you have hope today? At any moment, the Lord Jesus Christ could come again. I was talking to Bob's son over here, Ian, and he said, he said this, you know, he says, one minute I'm walking down the street and the next minute I woke up in the hospital. That quick. That quick. I just heard that Mrs. Sexton passed away. Her husband was the pastor of Temple Baptist Church in Powell, Tennessee, Crown College. They have Crown College and some, some folks from here have gone to that school. And There was a prayer request put out for Mrs. Mrs. Sexton. Went to the hospital, wasn't feeling well. Within 24 hours, she was in heaven. It can change so quickly. I'd want to know I have hope standing in those situations. 
But hope only comes from Jesus Christ through knowing him, being justified, declared righteous, having peace with God. Friend, let me say this. Your good works won't do it. Trying to be kind and all, and those are good things. We ought to try to do those. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Those are instructions for Christians. But they don't justify us in the sight of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's all about what Christ has done for you. Do you know him today? It's through him, it says in verse 2 there, that we have access into this grace. Do you know him? Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Maybe there's one say, Pastor, I'm not sure. I'm saved today. I need to know Jesus. I need to trust him. He'll save you, but you have to believe. You need a life-changing faith today to trust in Jesus Christ, to pay the price for your sin. Here's the thing. He's already paid for it. He already died on the cross of Calvary. All the sins of the world were already placed on his shoulder. Man goes to hell today because he rejects Jesus. Because of unbelief. But if you can put your faith in him today, you can be saved. He said, well, I, I don't understand it all. That's okay. We'll have a man with a man, a lady with a lady, take a Bible and answer any questions that you have. Show you what the Bible says about eternal life. I promise I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. Is there one that would slip up their hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I don't have this hope that you're talking about. I don't have peace with God, but I'd like to. Is there one? Let me tell you this. It's good to be saved. If you don't know that, that feeling, and salvation is not a feeling, but if you don't know that feeling that it's good to be saved, friend, can I encourage you? Talk to somebody today. Let us take a Bible. Let us help you.